It is Wednesday, May 1st, 2024. Welcome. It's a new month, new goals, new objectives. And I, yes, I do have a new haircut. I think they cut it a little short, but hey, it'll grow out. What am I talking about? Growth and marketing, of course, with four articles that will help you grow your company. First up, Clay Ostrom takes a look at thousands of brands and says they're playing it too safe. They're not differentiating themselves. So we'll take a look at that. Natalie Marco Tulio shares and shares precisely the method they use to grow MQLs by over 6x, introducing a personalized interactive demo. And then Andy Muborn shares his founder led playbook that he's going to be following. And then finally, David Tiltman takes a look at the data and says it may be time to retire the brand versus performance marketing paradigm when it comes to advertising. All right, let's get started. Let's get started with this post by Clay Ostrom. He is the founder of Map and Fire, and he starts off by saying, it can feel pretty uncomfortable to take a strong stance on something. In life, we're conditioned to avoid that because it creates risk. It means you're separating yourself from the safety of the pack. But what does that mean for business? If our brand doesn't fully commit to a specific point of view, we don't have to worry about being viewed negatively or eliminating a certain type of customer. It leaves us wiggle room. Unfortunately, that's a losing proposition when it comes to business because blending in with the pack makes it really easy to be ignored and forgotten. And this is so true. If your brand, if your website looks like everyone else's brand and website, why would someone choose you? You're not differentiating yourself in any fashion. And he says, as I've been combing through the data we've collected from our positioning app, Smoke Ladder, it highlights how these tendencies show up in brands. The app analyzes the messaging of a brand across 24 points of business value. It scores each point on a value score of 1 to 10 to see how well the brand articulates and em emphasizes the, po uh, the point. What we see is looking at the scores across brands is a hefty distribution around the middle section of scores from 5 to 8. So that's basically bland. That's like you're not standing out in any way. He says only 8% of the scores fall into that really strong stance segment, 9 to 10. Now he says you don't expect every, every point to be really strongly articulated, but you have to have some. He says in our model, we expect strong brands to have four to five points of really high value. If that were the case, we'd see the 9 to 10 bracket closer to 20%. And that's exactly the shift that many brands should try to make. Look at your fives and eights and figure out which one should be nines and tens. Now we've worked with dozens of different clients and we've analyzed hundreds of different websites. And this is what we see all the time. Anyone's homepage could be anyone else's homepage. Anyone else's brand could be someone else's brand. They don't want to take a stand. They don't want to differentiate themselves. And so it gets, it makes it hard to choose that solution. There has to be something that you're st you stand for, that your company stands for. And this ties back to my, an earlier video I did, which is on making enemies. And when I say making enemies, I'm not talking about who's your competitor. I'm talking about things that your brand and company stand against. And so the example I used was Salesforce back in the day, and they were against installed software. And that was a distinguishing feature of Salesforce. They became a leader in SaaS by being against installed software. And so that was very clear on where they stood from that perspective. And that's what we all need to do as brands. So I would take a few minutes to think about what you're against, what your vision is, and how do you clearly articulate that in a way that stands out. And then once you start uh, bringing it alive, look at it and say, is it clear what we are for and what we're against and how we're different? So... Good stuff, Clay. I appreciate it. Now, Natalie Marcatulio post. When I go to a SaaS website, I try to figure out, is this tool for someone like me? But asking users to personalize their experience can equal friction. So if you went through and said, what group are you in? The sort of general understanding is that it's going to cause people not to convert because they don't want to do this much work. But they went through and actually per, uh, personalized their interactive demo. And this is what they saw, a 6.3x increase in MQLs, over 2x lift in demo completions, and an over 45% lift in, in uh, folks who submitted our book a demo form. So they saw significant uplift from introducing a personalized demo. 
And so she, the cool thing about this whole post is that they go into, Natalie goes into really specific detail about how they actually accomplish this. And this is what I'm looking for from other content out there is laying out specifically how you did these things so other companies have an opportunity to replicate this and try this out. So she lays out the experiment timeline and they ran it for three weeks using an A-B testing uh, tool called Mutiny. And she said the persona specific demo results, which is why I shared earlier, the significant uplift, and then the steps to replicate this campaign. So she says, take a look at your tech stack, sync your leads to HubSpot, and then create persona specific interactive demo, and then create a HubSpot reporting to track results. So she goes in very, in very specific detail about how to implement this and then shares the data. The only thing I'd like to see additional, like the raw data, I mean, obviously not their specific people who submitted the leads, but if they're able to say by day, like this is when we implemented it, this is the number of MQLs we got, this is the number of uh, demo completions we got, this was the amount of traffic we got, that would be more beneficial. But in general, this is this is sort of a standard that we should be all as marketers all be trying to strive for in terms of helping out other marketers, giving the specific methodology used and the results from it. So I really appreciate this, Natalie. Thank you. Next up, Andy Muborn shares. I've been building B2B SaaS since I was 18. I don't know how old he is now, but I'll say it's been for a while. Uh, to be honest, I'm so tired of vanilla boring snooze fest B2B marketing tactics. Even my grandma called to tell me how boring most of it is. Here's how we're going to spice up our marketing at Distribute, which is his company. So he lays out these specific steps they're going to take. And I think this is good just as like inspiration for you if you're trying to look at how you can do a founder-led brand. He says, founder brand. Imagine this every single day. I'm going to post on LinkedIn. Nothing new. Each post I have a free lead magnet that's just too good to pass up. This isn't just about gathering emails, about inviting you to our world. And then he's going to do an email newsletter, podcast, free courses, and then live workshops. So if you're thinking about creating a founder-led brand, I think this is a good outline of, of tactic strategies you can consider to do that. So hopefully Andy will share his results as he goes through this process. But if you need some inspiration what to do from a founder-led brand standpoint, here are some ideas for you. And you can take a look at his post and see you know, how he discusses them. The last post I want to talk about is from David Tiltman, who's SVP of content at WARC. And he starts his post off by saying, is it time to retire brand versus performance as a model for ad investment? And he goes on uh, to share this quote from Jane Christian, who's manager, managing director analytics and insight at Essence Media Com UK. In our opinion, brand and performance as a terminology doesn't really affect how advertising is actually paying back. So just because there's a group called brand, just because there's a group of ads called performance, it doesn't mean it actually ties back to the overall performance of the advertising. And there's a chart here, which I'll share with you, which, um, which highlights that idea. We think it's better to think about scale efficiency and time as a dimension and should direct what your optimal that should direct what your optimal media mix is. I think the sooner that we move away from brand versus performance distinction, the better. And then David goes on to say, I'm starting to hear this from a few sources now. Brand versus performance is a great mental model, but it doesn't neatly operationalize. And let's face it, when it comes to budget allocation, performance marketing almost always wins. The clue is in the name. As the research shows, all media perform over both the short term and long term, but some have a greater carryover. So let's take a look at this chart. And so it's a chart that lays out full payback ROI and short term ROI. And this is for the United Kingdom. What's interesting about this chart is that every single channel performs has a significantly positive ROI. Um, and he's saying ROI is defined as the ratio between profit contribution and advertising spend, excluding pro excluding production costs. And so, in the and when you're thinking about the brand versus performance framework, is a lot of the things that you think are more oriented towards brand are actually performing better in terms of full payback ROI than, um, than the things that would be traditionally be classified as performance. 
And the um, some of the short, like generic PPC, short-term ROI is stronger, but overall the brand things perform better. So they are performing better than performance. Uh, and so, I mean, I think it does make sense to say like, let's consider these things together instead of just grouping them into different um, categories. The only thing that I'm a little hesitant about with this chart is that according to this, that if you invest in say print, you're gonna get six pounds of ROI for every pound you spent. So should you just go and take your, invest your entire budget in print? Now I appreciate the idea that we have to build out our brand and continue to advertise in order to build up that brand awareness and recall. But as a leader, within an organization, within a company, I wouldn't want the takeaway for you to be like, let's just allocate our entire marketing budget to one of these channels or into advertising. It's just much more complex than that in terms of growth. Um, and so I think this paints with too broad a brush and it doesn't necessarily mean it's applicable to individual companies, especially when you're in a, in a smaller stage, a smaller growth stage, when you're going from like say zero to 50 million ARR, We've just never worked with a client that would be like, hey, we're just gonna go all in on print advertising. And so I think there's a lot of nuance here that we need to make sure we address. Um, and so I'm just, my concern would be people would look at this and say, hey, let's go in on all some, uh, go all in on some of these brand, traditionally labeled brand channels. <clears throat> and that may not be the best for them as an organization. And so I uh, don't let that be the takeaway. I think the, the secrets behind growth are more complicated. And this is not just about spending a lot on advertising. Yes, you want to build your brand. Yes, you want to build up awareness. Yes, you want to build up recall and do that effectively. But it is definitely not as simple as saying, hey, we're going to spend on advertising. And this is a return, the ROI we expect to get, even if this data does exist, and is probably real at some level. Um, though I have not looked at the backend data, which I think would be very instructive to understand what this actually means. But anyway, that's it. So instead of just thinking about brand versus performance, uh, it's probably better to take a broader look at the channels that are available to you and, and still make sure that you are investing in your brand. Make sure you're investing in, in those, those categories that traditionally have fallen, um, in terms of investment due to focus on performance. But again, don't let the takeaway be just, let's go spend all of our money on advertising and we are going to be the next HubSpot or Salesforce. Um, growth is much more complicated than that. So anyway, that's it, uh, four great articles. One, make sure that you differentiate your messaging, your brand from the others. And that may require you, I mean, it's gonna require you to be bold and make a clear statement but that's what's going to get people to want to do business with you to stand out. And then think about the personalized interactive demos. Um, I see a lot of talk about demos out here, but I appreciate that Natalie walked us through step by step how they're able, what results they achieve and how they were able to achieve those results. So if you're interested in replicating what, what they did, what Navitech did, you would be able to do that. And um, I think it sets a good standard for, for others in terms of producing content that can be replicated. Andy Muborn just presents some ideas that he's going to pursue from a founder-led growth perspective. Um, and so if you're looking for ideas on that front, take a look at that. And then finally, David Tiltman uh, saying maybe it's time to retire the brand versus performance uh, messaging in terms of advertising. All right. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.